Just always assume that the mics are on. And my stuff's edited, and I still assume that. I said no. Hello everybody, welcome back to another episode of Brain Blaze. Oh, as always, I'm your host, Simon Wammers here, one of my writers in this case, Danny. Thank you, Danny. He writes me a script. It's called Reebok, $30 million gamble, more celebrity endorsements that backfired. I feel like after we covered the Kanye one, <laughs> where he's like, I can say anti-Semitic shit or they can cancel me. I don't know what sort of American accent that was, but it was bad. Um, and then they cancel him. I feel like they drop him, added ass. It's like, bro. There's, there's no bigger drop. Wasn't that like, it, it knocked his net worth by like half a bill or something insane because I didn't understand how money works. But I mean, anyway, let's just jump into it. Hopefully Danny will impress us. Hopefully this introduction where I've really undersold this video uh, hasn't made you click off. I mean, you're still here, so thank you. Let's go. Time Cop goes to the home gym. It can take months, years, or even decades for a major celebrity endorsement to turn sour after an unfortunate and unexpected development leads to the endorser quickly getting dropped like a hot, crispy pancake. <laughs> this is like, I, you know, you see that, although with YouTubers, I feel we all have like lots of brand deals that we work on and lots of stuff that we do. And generally, when one of us says something stupid and gets cancelled for something dumb, it's like the sponsors drop us for a while, but then eventually they come back. Oh, sure, they may have tried to separate us, but what we have is too strong, it's too powerful. Uh, that, that's kind of... There's very few YouTubers who've been, like, permanently cancelled, right? I mean, there's, like, YouTubers who've killed people, who've been predators, who've gone to prison, all this kind of... And, and obviously, those guys get permanently cancelled. But assuming you're not, like... Assuming it's just something stupid you said, rather than a horrible crime you've committed, generally, it tends to, you know, it tends to be okay. So I tend to like be like, cool, you can say some dumb whistle boy, people will hate you for a while, but then you'll be okay. Just don't murder anyone. <laughs> but there are other times when the proposed collaboration never really gets off the ground in the first place, and it still leads to a massive headache for both parties. Imagine getting hit with a $25 million lawsuit for making a pig's ear of attempting to endorse a product that you never even figured out how to use. Step forward, Jean-Claude Van Damme. You might know him as the Belgian martial artist and muscle-bound star of such films as Universal Soldier and Time Cop. I know him, wasn't he the dude who stood on, on top of two big trucks as they moved apart from each other? That's kind of literally all I know him for. I, I know his name, but I've never seen Universal Soul. Maybe I've seen Time Cop. I get the feeling he's not a particularly good actor. For me, he'll always be the voice of Master Croc from the Kung Fu Panda movies. Well, I, I've seen this. I watch these with my kids. My, my kid was too scared of it. She was like, Dad, this is scary. <laughs> and I'm like, I know, it's for like six plus, but it's really good. <laughs> Otherwise, we have to watch Trash Drug. And I'm like, ugh, ugh. Which is great. I mean, it's a, it's a wholesome kids TV show. But Kung Fu Panda's legitimately entertaining. Brussels certainly sit for adults. Obviously, Trash Truck's hugely popular with kids. Like, I refuse to let my kid watch Cocomelon. I'm like, no, Cocomelon. It always comes around in that YouTube algorithm. It's so dumb. And there's so much intelligent kids content out there that people would watch instead like story bots like um everyone loves bluey all of this good stuff why do we have to watch the absolute garbage that is co literally i could make up a coco melon song right now and uh, for any parents this is not gonna this is not gonna hit for anyone who doesn't have kids like young kids who watch coco melon but this is literally how it goes like let's uh, call a lamp and a chair the lamp and the chair are on the carpet they're on the carpet a lamp and a chair Mommy, there's a lamp and there's a chair on a carpet. That is f***ing Coco Melon. That is it. There is nothing more to it. And then they have some shitty animations, which I'm sure they knocked up in 30 seconds. And yes, the reason that I'm angry is I feel like it takes me more effort to make content and I'm far less successful. <laughs> but still, it's also, it's also shit. The National Football League thanks you for watching the Apple Music Super Bowl 57 halftime show. After the game, go to NFL.com slash live visual album to watch all of tonight's Super Bowl 57 performances. Right? <laughs> Does any is am I missing something with that? It's it's, shit. it's garbage. It gets a hundred million views an episode. <laughs> what am I doing with my life? <laughs> this. Like next thing I'm just gonna like synthesize a voice. You know, uh, what's it called? Auto-tune. Carpet and a chair! They're on a carpet, mummy! <laughs> Don't do it. 
but the muscles from Brussels certainly seem like a good fit to market the Total Flex Home Gym, the versatile home multi-gym workout solution for people who don't like mixing with sweaty oiks down in a real gym. Yeah, I got a multi-gym in my back, in my back room, in my back, literally is embedded in my back. No, it's in my back room and uh, I don't use it very much. I used to use it a lot and then I crashed off my bike last year and I didn't exercise for like a month and it's been gathering dust for about a year. But I'm back at the gym, which is good. I, I got a personal trainer because I was like, I'm shit at the gym. I don't really like it. I don't do all the exercises correctly. And so I was just like, fuck it. I'm just going to get a personal trainer and he's going to meet me there every time and he's going to like, you know, <laughs> he's going to tell me what to do. And it's been great. It's only been like two weeks. So we'll give it a couple of months and see how it settles in. But so far, it's very good. A guy I work with, like a consultant that I work with on like business stuff, he was like, dude, I got a personal trainer. It's great. And I'm like, okay, cool. <laughs> so I did the same thing and I'm like, it's great. It's great. The deal has been thrashed out in 2011 between the US manufacturer Thane International and Van Damme's agent, who had assured the company that both his client and his wife had fallen totally in love with the Total Flex home gym and were eager to put their considerable weight behind it. However, Thane had to fly out a filming crew to Van Damme's home in Brussels to record the infomercials, as Van Damme is obviously a very busy man. I say busy. At the time, he was devoting all of his energy to his own short lived, trashy reality TV series, Jean Claude Van Damme Behind Closed Doors. But when the filming crew arrived at Van Damme's doorstep, it quickly became clear that this promotional shoot wasn't designed to, wasn't destined to work out the way they'd envisioned. Van Damme had made no effort to learn his lines and didn't seem capable of reading the script presented to him. I'm sure they're paying you a fortune. Just do your job, Claude. Come on. <laughs> if someone was like going to pay me like, what was it, millions of dollars? And they'd be like, okay, we're actually going to show up at your house. <laughs> we're going to come to you for millions of dollars. I'd be like, shit, millions of dollars. I'll come wherever you want. <laughs> Hold on. And they'll be like, okay, all you got to do is like learn these lines. I'll be like, okay, cool. I don't care how long those lines are. Those lines could be pages. They could make me memorize the Harry Potter book. And I'd f***ing do it for millions of dollars. And I think I could. I think I could be that motivated. Although Harry Potter's really not. Could you memorize a whole Harry Potter book? I think with those memory tricks, you could. I once memorized Pi to 120 digits just because I was so fascinated with memory palaces. And it's really, I don't remember it now, obviously, but it's insane that that's possible. And I just did it like in a couple of days of like part time, just, just having a go. It's crazy. And it got even worse, it never even bothered to try out the equipment supplied to him beforehand and was struggling to get to grips with how it worked. The filming crew observed that the actor's behavior was becoming increasingly erratic and chaotic as he failed to make any sense of the Total Flex home gym. While all of this was unfolding, the cameras were still rolling on Van Damme's own reality show, and the actor finally lost the plot when he angrily turned to those cameras and informed his loyal viewers that he couldn't bring himself to endorse such a shitty product. An interesting point to note is that whilst Van Damme was trying and tying himself in knots and screaming at the sky in frustration, his wife quietly figured out how to use the Total Flex home gym in a matter of minutes. <laughs> well, I guess Jean-Claude Van Damme is not exactly known for his giant brain, is he? After Van Damme walked away from the infomercial in a strop, Thane International sued the act of a breach of contract, fraud, and misrepresentation, seeking a total of $25.2 million in damages as reimbursement of airfare, hotel expenses, court costs, and punitive damages. $25, $25 million. Jesus Christ, what hotel were you staying in? That was 12 years ago, and it's not clear how or if the lawsuit was resolved. It may have just been discreetly dropped or settled, or it could well be still rumbling on. If it was still rumbling on, there'd be like some reporting on it. So it definitely got settled out of court. It's almost when something just disappears like this, settled. I'd like to think that this story could still have a happy ending with a completed infomercial. All the former Time Cop needed was an extra 12 years to fully comprehend the instruction manual. Great job. <laughs> marketing grease. If you have any interest in soccer, sometimes called proper football, you might regard David Beckham as one of the greatest midfielders of the 90s and noughties and oh, one of the best set-piece specialists in history. What is a set-piece specialist? I've no idea what that means. I know nothing about football, by the way. I might be British, but I'm not a, I'm not a sports person. For the rest of us, he's the bloke who made a fortune from endorsing any old shit and the bloke who married posh spies during a ceremony which involved them perching on velvet thrones and looking down at the peasants who were lucky enough to blag an invite. Really? <laughs> <laughs> I don't even remember that. I know he's married to Posh Spice, Victoria Beckham. She's much more successful than him, right? She started her own, like, old, whole fashion empire and shit. 
right? It's probably true to say that Beckham is just as famous for his haircuts as his football prowess. Whether he was sporting a mohawk or a ponytail, any new plot twist in Beckham's golden locks would inspire a stampede to the hairdressers from his admiring fans desperate to emulate the same look. Then this inspired a cunning marketing opportunity for the makers of Brill Cream. The iconic British hairstyling cream was all the rage back in the 1950s and 60s when teddy boys were practically bathing in the stuff to pull off those super slick if slightly greasy quiffs. Yeah, that was a weird look, wasn't it? The poppy looks like, what? What's it? I've just covered it. Now there's this wet look. Have you heard of this? Like people, I think it's women, who uh, put like so much product in their hair that it makes it look like they've just stepped out of the shower, which I do not understand. <laughs> I think whoever was behind that marketing campaign really wants to sell a lot of whatever that sh is going in their hair is. And surely it must feel like mega crispy. Your touch would be like, why would you do that? Why is that pleasant? I mean, honestly, I'd do it if, uh, if it meant getting my my hair back. The popular television commercial jingles of the day promised customers a little dab will do ya, use more only if you dare, the gals will all pursue ya, they'll love to run their fingers through your hair. Yes, yes, nothing like running through your hair, running your fingers through greasy hair that's also somehow crispy at the same time. And I used to use gel when I was a kid. I think like, we... Was it called a quiff? I think it was also called a quiff, where you'd have your hair like this, and then you have a little pokey up bit at the front. This was very popular with uh, 13 year old boys when I was 13. And yeah, just be like this crispy bit at the front. <laughs> okay. God, that's weird. If someone said, Do you want to have that or be balls? I'd be like, Balls. <laughs> bald, 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 bald. But by the time we got to the 1990s, Brill Cream's fortunes had very much declined, and the product was largely considered to be the stuff that your granddad still keeps in the bathroom cupboard for whenever he fancies trying his luck with the ladies on bingo night. Perhaps the highly influential superstar and fashion guru David Beckham could help Brill Cream bounce back from the dead and switch on whole new generations to this emulsion of water and mineral oil stabilized with beeswax. Thanks, Danny. All that extra information that I definitely needed to know. He wouldn't come cheap, though. In 1997, Brill Cream paid a reported $6 million for Beckham to become the new face of the brand over a four-year period. That's a good deal. That's a good deal. And that's $6 million in 1997 money. That's more today. And the initial results were promising, as impressionable football fans flocked down to Superdrug to get this new hipster grease flowing into their own follicles. But then Beckham scored a couple of own goals and let down the side just one year later during the 1998 World Cup. Beckham was sent off the pitch in disgrace during a match against Argentina after a young carrier to uncharacteristically experienced a to madness and kicked one of his opponents. <laughs> oh my. England went on to lose the match and were knocked out of the World Cup, and Beckham copped the blame for his infantile behavior. I think even I remember that happening, and everyone was really angry. Overnight, he briefly turned from football hero to Billy No Mate. Later in 2000, he really cocked up the collaboration with Brill Coombe after he proudly emerged from his latest styling session sporting a newly shaved head. This posed something of a problem, as it's almost completely unfathomable for a man with no hair to promote a hair product. <laughs> this video brought to you by Keeps. <laughs> Seriously, just imagine such a bar. Okay, Danny, okay, okay, we get it, we get it. We get it. A bigger issue is that Beckham's young fans immediately started copying his shaved head look, so now the only thing they could do with their leftover Brill Cream was to give it to Grandad. Despite the fact that Golden Locks had thrown the brand under the Swivelly Barber's chair, or more likely just forgotten that he was supposed to be endorsing Brill Cream for another year, the company didn't seem to get too upset as they announced that they had no plans to drop Beckham over his choice of haircut, despite reports that sales of the product have subsequently dropped by 25%. It's speculated that Beckham may have quietly lost a hip chunk of that sponsorship money from Brill Cream, but his wife Victoria is having none of it. She said, if he had lost that kind of money by cutting his hair off, I would be ripping out what was left of it. Savage! Savage, savage, savage. Weight watching scam. What happens to the shape of a sporting legend after they finally hang up their boots and turn their hand to TV punditry? Well, one possible side effect is that they suddenly become a bit porky. Perfectly understandable, really, after they quit working up a sweat and focus on delivering words of wisdom from the comfort of a pundit's chair. That's initially what happened to former professional basketball player Charles Barkley when he retired from the sport in 2000 and took up a new career as an analyst for TNT. I thought Charles Charles Barkley was a musician. Is there someone Barkley? Is it Niles Barkley? Is there a Niles Barkley? I feel like there's a singer or like a musician who has a name like this. 
<laughs> Did he have a later career? I don't know. I'm really curious. I'm almost going to go look it up, but I'm not going to, and you guys are going to tell me in the comments later. The former NBA legend, who was already known by the nickname The Round Mound of Rebounds, notably piled on 100 pounds over the next decade after it stopped running around the basketball court. By 2011, it decided to turn to Weight Watchers, or at least Weight Watchers had decided to turn to him as they invited him to become the new spokesman for the popular diet program. This is one of those ones where it's like, if I got a sponsorship, they'd be like, Simon, we found the perfect sponsor for you, Weight Watchers. They'd be like, oh no, I've really let myself go, haven't I? <laughs> you know, it's like... <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Let's not that let, let that happen. <laughs> Martin and me working as a team. He's my trainer. <laughs> He's gonna keep me in shape. <laughs> not let me get embarrassed <laughs> by my sponsorships. Maybe you can also help me grow my hair back. <laughs> we don't know how much Charles was paid for the deal, but it's reported that Jennifer Hudson was paid around $3 million at around the same time for a similar collaboration with Weight Watchers. And this is a rare example of an endorsement partnership in which there's really no scope for deception. It's not like one of those endorsements where a celebrity is paid a huge pile of money to pretend to like Samsung phones, but then inevitably gets caught out using their preferred iPhone. With Weight Watchers, you can see the results for yourself. If Charles Barkley is the same size as he was before he started Started promoting Weight Watchers, then something is clearly not working here. I feel like there's plenty of room for deception here. Like, um, so he could go to Weight Watchers and he could lose the weight that way, but he's also like rich. He could have his like tummy stapled, he could have liposuction, he could have like his own personal trainer at his gym at home. All that sort of stuff. Look, if you pay for stuff, it's gonna like like I have no doubt in my mind that me going to the tra gym and paying the trainer to go along with me is more effective it's a much better use of my time and i'm gonna get better results and so could charles barkley compared to like john who's like just regular off the street john who's like trying to try weight rogers he can't afford liposuction or any of that stuff so there's plenty of room for deception, isn't there? At this point, you might be thinking that Charles cocked up the deal by piling on another hundred pounds while trying to convince his fan that fans that Weight Watchers is the best thing since sliced cucumbers. But no, Charles was doing well on the weight front. He had visibly lost 38 pounds since embarking upon the diet program, and he claimed that he was continuing to lose a further two pounds every week. However, and he then also shredded a big dollop of credibility in 2012 when he was commenting on a game between Atlanta Hawks and Miami Heat and didn't realize that his microphone was switched on during a TNT commercial break. Guys, can we really learn this? Look, if there's a studio and the electricity is on and all that, just assume the mics are on. Just assume that. Please. I do the same thing. Like, just always assume that the mics are on. And my stuff's edited, and I still assume that. I say no. Charles struck up a candid conversation with his fellow TV anchors on the subject of easy money, unaware that his observations were still being broadcast on the NBA TV platform. Oh, God. He's like, guys, I got this. Gr I gave paid so much money, I don't have to do anything. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, it'd be like me having a conversation about don't tell keeps that I'm actually bald. <laughs> They've never noticed. During a long monologue about wealth, Charles blurted out, I thought this was the greatest scam going, getting paid for watching sports. But this Weight Watchers thing is a bigger scam. Well, if he's like saying, I thought this was the greatest scam going, getting paid for watching sports, that's legitimately his job. It's not a, like, I sometimes feel like this is the, like what I do is the greatest scam going because it's like, oh my God, I get paid like really well to do something that is super enjoyable. It's like, it's kind of strange. It's like, why would I go get a regular job? And I'm well aware that, you know, it's mostly luck and a sprinkling of hard work. But I, I get that. That first part of the thing's okay. But then when you're like, <laughs> there's an actual scam. <laughs> Well then, let's see how that goes. Now, it's worth pointing out that Charles was never trying to suggest that the whole diet program was fraudulent. He was simply communicating his excitement over how he was getting paid a ridiculous amount of money for very little work. That's not a scam, though. Honestly, I get paid a... a that would not call it ridiculous, but a large amount of money for what doesn't seem like very much work. It's not a scam, it's just business. But I still imagine the Weight Watchers weren't particularly happy to hear the word scam used in the same sentence as their brand by the guy who they were paying millions of dollars to say positive things about them. To be fair, the company played it pretty cool. Weight Watchers released a statement which agreed with the lovably unfiltered Charles Barkley on how being a spokesman for Weight Watchers was a great gig. Meanwhile, Charles later clarified that getting paid to lose weight was his definition of a great scam. This is totally fair. I'm kind of on Charles' side here. He's not doing anything wrong. Wrong. He's using Weight Watchers to lose money and he's getting paid for it. It's enormously motivational. It's not a scam. He's just using the word scam in a really weird way. 
right? He's clearly not getting that company memo on avoiding the word scam, if at all possible, when discussing the brand, though. Charles may have missed his true vocation as a spokesperson for Theranos. I, I, Dan, Danny, I'm not with you. I think Charles is totally fine on this one. I think he said, guys, this is the greatest scam around. See all this weight I've lost? I am getting paid to do this. Isn't this insane? And that's not a scam. That's just like you got famous and now get paid to do stuff. It's, it's great. I hear some of you guys still think the Weight Watchers is just for women. It's a scam. On your bike, Armstrong. The fall from grace of American cyclist Lance Armstrong has to be one of the biggest and swiftest losses of sponsorship money in sporting history. But did he really manage to lose $75 million in a single day? Holy shit, Lance. And why isn't he completely skint today? Well, because he made loads of money. Like, sure, he got kicked out of the sport or whatever. Because he, Was he doping? He was using those blood injections or some shit like that, wasn't he? But that doesn't mean they take away all of his money that he previously earned. <laughs> Armstrong had won the heart of the nation after the cancer survivor went on to win a record seven breaking consecutive Tour de France titles between 1999 and 2005. Of course, that record went on to be unbroken when he was later found in 2012 to have used performance enhancing drugs throughout his entire career. He was stripped of all his titles after his, he was exposed by the United States' anti doping agency as the ringleader of the most sophisticated, professionalized, and successful doping program the sport has ever seen. Armstrong's career had been dogged by accusations and suspicions over illicit drug use since the 90s, but this didn't seem to affect his long list of lucrative sponsorship deals. And in fact, his sponsors didn't ultimately drop him quite as quickly as some might remember. When the USADA first charged Armstrong in 2012, his biggest sponsor, Nike, pledged continued support to the cyclist and appeared to express remorse over the poor lamb's current situation. Let's pause to reflect on one of Nike's more memorable campaigns with Armstrong, in which the cyclist reveals everybody wants to know what I am on. What am I on? I'm on my bike, busting my ass six hours a day. <laughs> it's like that liver king. You guys follow that scandal where he is like, no, I just eat raw liver. I'm just eating that raw liver every day. And he's like, and many steroids. <laughs> <laughs> like it was leaked in some email or something from me. He sent an email to some like gym dude or whatever. And he was like, bro, he's on like 700 different steroids or something like that. And then he comes out and he's like, I am on steroids and it's managed. <laughs> it's like, bro, look at your body. No sh**. Here, Stewie, try this. Yeah, what the hell are you doing? Whoa. Oh my. Suddenly, I'm full of energy. Nike's position only changed a week later when Armstrong announced that he wouldn't contest the charges. This was to avoid the potential toll on his family rather than the overwhelming weight of evidence against him. <laughs> sure it was, Lance. Sure it was. At this point, Nike suddenly decided that Armstrong had misled them for over a decade and terminated the contract, leading to a rapid domino effect in which all of Armstrong's 11 sponsors, including the likes of Trek, Radio Shack, Honey Stinger, and 24 Hour Fitness, I've heard of none of those. I've heard, sorry, I've heard of Radio Shack. I've heard of none of the others had dropped the disgraced cyclist within a couple of days. And you trusted me, even though you knew you shouldn't. It was Armstrong himself who later tearfully claimed to Oprah Winfrey that he had lost $75 million in a single day, but Forbes reckon it's more accurate to say that he has lost a projected $150 million over the course of the next decade. He's not doing so bad, though. Armstrong now owns bicycle shops and coffee shops and all kinds of sh**. But it was, yeah, because he diversified, which is very smart. Like, I diversify, like, I make money, and it, like, goes into the stock market and property and all of this stuff because, you know, suddenly it can all go away. And if you're not, if you're spending all your money like an idiot, then when something terrible happens, like this, I mean, fortunately, I'm not taking tons of steroids and I'm a Tour de France cyclist, but you know, whatever. Like, or YouTube goes away. It's like, oh my God, <laughs> YouTube could just be like tomorrow. We don't monetize videos anymore. And you'll be like, okay, okay. I'm glad I socked some money away for that one, YouTube. Jesus. Can I go? I guess I better go figure out TikTok. <laughs> He invested 100000 in his mate's new capital firm, which went on to buy early stakes in a certain company called Uber. Oh my. Despite the fact that Armstrong didn't have a clue what Uber was supposed to be, that investment went on to net him somewhere in the region of 20 to $30 million. And Armstrong credits the investment with saving his family. Fucking hell, mate. 
20 to 30 mil. He says today is too good to be true, so at least it has something in common with Lance Armstrong's professional cycling career. Dan and Dave During the lead-up to the 1992 Summer Olympics in Barcelona, some people wondered if Reebok had lost the plot when they first launched their latest marketing campaign at Super Bowl 26. The athletic shoe brands had been losing serious market share to fierce rivals Nike in the ongoing sneaker wars, and it appeared that they might be taking a huge gamble in their latest strategy. Instead of getting a high-profile name to become the new face of Reebok for the upcoming Olympic Games, they plowed close to $30 million into a campaign featuring a couple of completely unknown American decathletes called Dan and Dave, but it wasn't quite as reckless as it may sound. Barely anybody outside of the relatively obscure decathlon field had heard of Dan O'Brien and Dave Johnson, but those with their ear to the crack knew that Dan and Dave were on the brink of becoming sporting superstars and were heavily tipped to take the top two medals in the decathlon event. The only burning question was which of the two evenly matched decathletes would win the gold. And so, Reebok launched an eight-month advertising campaign which ignited a friendly rivalry and invited viewers to choose between Team Dan and Team Dave. The series of commercials featured footage of the two decathletes growing up training and preparing for potential glory in Barcelona, and it turned the previously unknown pair into overnight sensations as the country fell under the grip of Dan and Dave mania. But which one of them would ultimately triumph? Well, first they had to get past the Olympics qualifying event in New Orleans, and this is where things start to go a bit pear-shaped for one of them. In front of an audience of screaming fans all proudly sporting either Dan or Dave t-shirts, and hats they had just bought from the Reebok stalls. Dave Johnson navigated the qualifying event with relative ease as expected, but Dan O'Brien sent shockwaves through the stadium by making a total hash of it. He started off pretty well, but following three completely bungled attempts at the pole vault, he walked away with a zero score for that event and subsequently failed to qualify for the Olympics. An unpatriotic representative from rivals Nike was glimpsed expressing utter joy from the stands as he realized that one of Reebok's boys had fluffed it. I suspect that Dan t-shirts were selling a bit cheaper by the end of the qualifying event. But fair play to both Dan and Reebok, who managed to partially rescue a potentially botched marketing campaign. Dan showed what a good sport he was by continuing to participate in a heavily tweaked series of Reebok commercials in which he lazily lounged by the pool drinking cocktails while Dave continues with his intense training program. That's pretty smart. Well done there. And also, I'm sure he's like, please, 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 please keep betting me. (laughs) It's probably a mad deal. Besides, although the campaign had lost the compelling competitive angle, at least Dave was still destined to bring home the gold for Reebok. Oh no, wait, scrap that. Although he was now a strong favorite to win the decathlon, Dave was suffering from a foot injury by the time he landed in Barcelona, and he had to settle for a bronze medal. Ah. Oh. Reebok, what have you done? Funnily enough, the gold medal was run by a Czech athlete, Robert Zmelek, who oh, was also an endorser of Reebok but hadn't appeared anywhere in the campaign. Dave retired shortly afterward, but the good news is that Dan eventually won his gold at the Olympic Games in Atlanta in 96. So maybe Reebok were ultimately triumphant over the course of the long game. No, that doesn't work either. By 96, the gold medal winning decathlete had switched allegiance to Nike. Poor old Reebok. Still, Nike was also the company who were destined to see record-breaking Lance Armstrong emerging ominously in their rear-view marketing mirror. (laughs) Hello, Lance. Thank you for watching. The lamp and the chair are on the carpet. They're on the carpet, a lamp and a chair. Mommy, there's a lamp and there's a chair on a carpet. That is... Coco Melon, that is it! There is nothing more to it, and then they have some shitty animations, which I'm sure they knocked up in 30 seconds.